Her story is a depraved hitchhiking nightmare. Her driver beat her, violated her, then cut off her arms. He stuffed her in a drain pipe and left her for dead. But this 15-year-old girl refused to go away so easily. Let's recap. One early summer day in 1978, she made up her mind to hit the road and never look back. California seemed like the perfect spot to start fresh, but with no cash and no wheels, Mary had to rely on the classic thumb-in-the-air approach. Now, back in the 70s, a girl could hitchhike without ending up dead. Probably. I mean, they thought they could. Most of the time, most of the time you'd survive. Maybe. She stuck out her thumb and waited for a ride. And finally, one of the cars stopped. Behind the wheel was Lawrence Singleton, a guy who looked so ordinary, you'd never believe he was evil incarnate. He was pushing 50, so to 15-year-old Mary, he seemed about as threatening as somebody's grandpa. That couldn't be farther from the truth. Turns out Mary had unknowingly caught a lift straight into a horror movie. But why don't we take it from the top? Mary Vincent's story starts in Las Vegas, right in the middle of a big working class family. Her dad's the guy with the tools keeping the slot machines spinning, and her mom deals the cards at the blackjack tables. Mary's got skills with her hands too, but her dreams are on the dance floor. She's got some serious moves. At just 13, she stole the spotlight, opening for the local Miss Universe pageant with a solo performance. And two years go by, Mary turns 15, and the family drama hits a peak. She figures she's better off on her own. So with her boyfriend in tow, they set their sights on California, the land of new beginnings. They spend the summer in the Bay Area calling his car home until he gets nabbed for messing with another high school girl. And just like that, Mary's alone. But most nights, the streets are her bedroom, curling up behind dumpsters or sneaking into unlocked cars for some shut-eye. Now, tough as it is, it beats going back to the tension back home in Vegas. But as the days pass, she can't shake off the homesickness. When September rolls around, she sets her sights on Los Angeles, hoping to reconnect with her grandpa. Maybe even hit it big in Hollywood. Sadly, that dream would never come true because of this man. Lawrence Singleton's story starts way back in Tampa, Florida, during the Roaring Twenties and the Tough Thirties. Details about his early years are sketchy, but what's clear is he lived the life of a merchant seaman, more at home on the waves than anywhere else. Booze was his constant companion, sneaking in a drink whenever he could. Get a few in him and he'd flip to his Mr. Hyde side, a total night and day transformation. Fast forward to 1978 when he crosses paths with Mary. She's hitching rides with a couple of friends who are also headed to LA when Larry spots her. Now he says he's heading to Reno, but he's willing to drop her off in Los Angeles. Now that is red flag number one since LA is in the exact opposite direction. Mary's pals aren't digging this setup at all. Now Larry's behind the wheel of this blue van, which is pretty much gutted in the back. No seats, just floor space. He's cool with giving Mary a lift, but he says it's just her he can take. Girl, this guy goes, her friend goes, I wouldn't get in there if I was you. But it, Mary, she didn't take that advice. If only she had. But exhaustion's got the better of her and all she wants is to crash at her grandpa's place. So she climbs in. Settling down, she lights up a cigarette, which immediately makes her sneeze. And that's when Larry makes a move. He's reaching out like he's some kind of doctor. He's like grabbing the back of her neck, supposedly feeling for a fever. Let's check if you're sick, he says. Well, Mary's thinking, fantastic, this guy's already creeping on me. Well, Larry's nursing a milk carton as they cruise toward I-5. They're heading for LA, but it's not dairy he's sipping on, it's liquor. Well, Mary's checking out the signs and she figures they're on track, so she lets herself drift off. But when she wakes up, LA is nowhere in sight. Instead, they're way off course, heading east towards Nevada of all places. In a flash, Mary's on high alert, feeling around her seat until she finds a sharp stick under her seat. She points it at him, demanding he make a U-turn. And would you believe it? He actually does. He can tell that she doesn't trust him as far as she can throw him. So he slips into this confused old man routine, like, whoops, my bad, just a simple mix up. Wouldn't dream of hurting you, girly. Yeah, right. So just as the sun dips below the horizon, Larry veers off the interstate, guiding the van down a secluded canyon road. He's muttering something about needing a bathroom break. Well, Mary's got to go too, so she's not about to argue. Stepping out, she bends down to tie her shoe, and that's when it hits her, a blinding pain at the back of her head. Next thing she knows, she's thrown into the back of the van. 
What follows is a nightmare. He tears her clothes off, ties her hands, and he assaults her. After he coldly gets back behind the wheel, doesn't even bother putting his clothes on, he just keeps driving like nothing happened. Then he pulls over again, forces her to drink, and then he attacks her once more. Overwhelmed by the ordeal, Mary passes out cold. She wakes up to the side of Larry, rummaging around in the back of the van for something. Mary can't tell what. She's still naked, her arms outstretched, her hands tied to the walls of the van. She pleads with him to set her free. You want to be free, he says. I'll set you free. Pulling out an axe, he cuts off her left arm first and then her right. He hauls her out of the van and throws her down a 30-foot embankment. At the bottom, he shoves her inside a concrete drainage pipe. There, he says, now you're free. Lawrence drives off into the night thinking Mary's as good as dead. But Mary's not ready to call it quit. Not tonight. There's this voice inside her. It's loud. It's telling her, get up, keep going. To keep the bleeding in check, she shoves her wounds into the mud, keeping her arms raised as she hauls herself back up the road. She's totally lost, no clue where she is, but the distant rumble of traffic on the interstate pulls her forward. By sheer luck, a couple who took a wrong turn ended up on this deserted stretch of road, and there's Mary, right in their headlights. She's a sight, coated in mud and blood, stark naked with the remains of her arms lifted high. She's made it about three miles from where Lawrence left her, standing there in the road like some kind of survivor straight out of a zombie movie. Now, Mary's journey back is nothing short of a medical marathon. Surgeons are pulling off miracles, even grafting part of her leg to patch up her arms. Dancing the way she dreamed of it, that's not in the cards anymore. But even as she's piecing herself back together, Mary nails the description of Lawrence Singleton. It's so accurate. His neighbors recognized him and called it in. Cops had him in cuffs just 10 days later. Now fast forward six months and there they are in court, Mary and Lawrence, eye to eye. By that time, Mary was getting the hang of her new prosthetic arms. Mary's words in court are powerful. Who could look at this 15-year-old girl and think, no, he didn't do it? The jury sure couldn't. And after her testimony, she walks past Lawrence and he leans toward her and whispers, I'll finish this job if it takes me the rest of my life. Turns out he was dead serious about that promise, just not in the way Mary or anyone else might have guessed. Well, under California law, Lawrence gets a maximum sentence of 14 years. So the guy who put Mary through hell could be walking free before anyone knew it, but... No one saw it coming as quick as it did. Lawrence was out in just eight years, thanks to his good behavior behind bars. But finding a place to call home, well, that was a whole other battle. Because every time prison officials tried to settle him into a new California town, the locals weren't having it. They ran him out time and time again, because no one wanted this guy anywhere near their families. In the end, they parked Lawrence in a trailer right on the San Quentin prison property. For a whole year, he was under the watchful eyes of the guards, living out his parole until it wrapped up in 88. After that, he was free to roam. Lawrence made his way back to Tampa, his old stomping grounds. Word has it there was a car dealer there who tried to pay him $5,000 just to pack up and disappear. And then someone went and blew up a homemade bomb outside his place. Talk about an unwelcome committee. But Larry was the most hated man in America. Nobody thought he deserved a second chance, yet he got one anyway. According to a prison spokesperson, Lawrence is completely diffused as a threat to society. You don't have to worry about him going on a bender and going out looking for a hitchhiker. That quote didn't age well. He hit the bottle and was ready to kill again by the late 90s. At the age of 70, he lures Roxanne Hayes, a mother of three, to his Tampa home. There, he brutally butchers her. Neighbors hear her screams and they call the cops. When the police come knocking, there's Lawrence answering the door like it's just another day, except he's drenched in blood. He tries spinning this yarn about a vegetable chopping accident gone wrong, but then he shifts his body just enough for one of the officers to catch a glimpse of Roxanne's lifeless form on the living room floor behind him. This is it for Lawrence. His days of breathing free air are over. Mary is going to make sure of it. She hops on a plane to Florida, ready to stand up in court against him one more time. Now, with the death penalty on the table, his lawyers argue that Roxanne died during a drunken struggle over money and a knife. He didn't plan on killing her. It just sort of happened. Yeah, right. Well, the jury didn't buy it either. Lawrence Singleton was sentenced to death on April 14th, 1998, but the state of Florida didn't get the chance to execute him. He died of cancer on New Year's Eve, 2001. He was 
was 74. With Lawrence gone, Mary could finally move on with her life, but that didn't mean the nightmares went away. Ever since the day it happened, she could hardly sleep. She was afraid to sleep. She left home a trusting teenager. Larry took all that trust away. She found that painting helped her deal with her trauma. And before the attack, she could hardly draw a straight line. And now she creates family portraits on commission. Mary found her strength and hope in her two kids. They were her light in the darkness. More than anything, she was determined not to let the shadow of Lawrence Singleton loom over her life. She won't even give him the power of his name. She'll only call him my attacker. It was a long, tough road to recovery through the aftermath of that horrific night. But Mary came out the other side with a fierce resolve, channeling her pain into purpose. She became a relentless champion for the rights of victims. By 1998, her efforts helped pass California's Singleton Bill a law to make sure that monsters who torture their victims can't slip out of prison early. Well, Mary Vincent's legacy, a beacon of hope, and a testament to the power of resilience. <sighs> Amazing, right?